And today we're going to go to John 4 again, three weeks in a row. And we're going to tackle the Samaritan story, and I promise you it's not going to go the way you thought. Um, As I've studied this passage again and again and again, it just takes a a different turn for me every time. And so today we're going to hone in, starting right around verse number 7. Um, we, we talked the past couple of weeks on a couple of different topics that I would encourage you to get online and check out. Number one, dig a well. Uh, number two, last week we were talking about, hey, what well are you getting resource from? You know, even Jesus got tired, and that's what the Bible tells us. Just a word of encouragement that if you're tired today, you're not far off from being like Jesus. Because even in his ministry, the Bible said he sat down at that well, tired from a journey. And so we try to speak some encouragement into some of you or us that may be going through a journey or a season of life, let's call it that, and and may be tired from what's going on around you. Um, I think Satan tries to use exhaustion against us, Um, makes us feel like, okay, you're tired, you must be doing something wrong. I'll, I'll be honest with you, the Bible even tells us many times, I'll give you one example where it says, don't get weary in well doing. Don't grow weary. In other words, doing the right thing sometimes is exhausting. All right. How many of you have raised children before? (laughs) Raising children can be exhausting. Am I right? I I mean, now you're in the grandparent phase and and, and your children may be out. How many of you got grandkids that come in and you're reminded that there's a lot of energy in those kids, right? And and, and, but yet there's a lot of, of searching in them, too. That's why God, I love how Jesus said to his disciples, don't get in the way of the kids. Like, don't 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 hinder them from coming because it takes their type of faith to accept the things of God. So today we're going to go to verse number seven. Read with me if it would. you would. It says, Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, she said to Jesus, sorry, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? I wrote in my margin, this isn't the whole sermon today, but you need to get this. You're never too good to minister to somebody. All right, even if your belief systems don't line up, even if your nationalities don't line up. I mean, we're living in a world where really, and I I believe it's intentional, okay, I'm gonna say this, that they're trying to divide us based on our differences, whether it be our political differences, our color differences, or our social standings, they're trying to drive a wedge. And, and I love this passage because Jesus has made it clear. It doesn't matter if you're a woman or Samaritan. It doesn't matter where you are. I love you, and I'm coming to you. And that needs to be the mindset of us. You know, we, we, I've said this a couple weeks ago. Y'all remember that song? Jesus loves the little children, all the, world, uh, all the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. What, what are they? Precious. And it's like, why have we lost that fundamental belief? Where has it been misguided? And, and, and I've, I've learned this, and I want you to maybe just take this down in the note, that I believe today that hate is not the anthem of the world. I just believe it's screaming the loudest. You see it more and you hear about it more. But from the beginning when God so loved the world, and from the beginning when God so loved Adam that he put life in Adam's nostrils, from the moment Adam breathed, Even before that moment, from the moment God decided to create Adam, love was the anthem. And since then, the world has been seeking it. The world has been desiring it. I do believe, and and believe me, it would be hard to change my mind, but I am open to a biblical conversation about it. But love is the number one desire of every heart that has ever lived. From the time an infant is born, that infant is craving the love and affection of a mother, of a father. From the time you got breath in your lungs, you were seeking love. That's why I firmly believe that when the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. You'll find that the number one desire of your heart is met by a loving, unconditional, loving God who loves fully and completely without withholding his love. The desire of your heart today is not more money. That might be the want of your life. The desire of your heart today is not to be more famous. That might be the want of your life. The desire of every person that's alive today is to be loved. And if you find your delight in the Lord, you'll find a love that you have never known before that will satisfy you. If you commit your ways to him, he directs your path. In other words, it's like this. I want you to understand it. Everything you think will make you happier will not unless you're thinking that only God's love is all you need. 
Because everything else around you changes, fades, grows old, it wears out, the new smell goes away, right? And everything around you, it, it, it will fade into obscurity, but only the love of God remains. And so in this, I want you to understand that we're seeing a passage that's unfolding where Jesus has set an example that says, forget your religious traditions, forget what your church thinks and believes, forget your denominational barrier, forget all these things, and remember that people matter today. And what they're going through matters, and where they are matters. Jesus didn't go to the church and find the cleanest woman in Samaria. He went to the dirty of the dirty, the one living outside of marriage, which in that day was way different than today. And, and he went to her, and he said, I love you. I'm choosing you. I'm coming to give something to you. And God help us. We have somehow in our churches forgot how to love sinners. And we need to understand that the church was established for one reason and one reason only. For sinners to encounter a loving father. So we need to understand today that there's got to be a deep, meaningful love. Beyond what they look like, what they smell like, what they've done. A deep, meaningful love. I'm going to take a step further. In, in Romans chapter number 2, I was teaching the youth this on Wednesday with Julie we were having this conversation, and Libby helped us and did such a beautiful job. We were talking about how a lot of times we want to condemn chapter number one, all the list of sins that you find there. But then Paul writes in chapter number two that says, and you who think you can judge these people or condemn these people, you're no better. You're just the same. And the problem is you know better. And then it says this next statement, the measure of which you judge another, you're actually bringing on yourself. And so if you ever in your life, please keep note of this, look at somebody and say, God can't use them, you're actually saying that to yourself. And if you look at somebody and you say, well, they did this and they were this and they were that and therefore they can't be, you're actually saying it to yourself. That's what Paul wrote in chapter number two, because you're a sinner too. Because in God's mind, there's not this sin and this sin. There's sin. It's a level playing field. And you might not want it to be because a lot of times we try to compare our spirituality to the spirituality of another. DJ and I were having this conversation last week. When it tells us to evaluate ourselves carefully, it's saying, hey, don't use a false balance. Use the measure of Christ. In other words, here's perfection. That's what you look at with your life and say, where do I measure up? Don't look at somebody else because here's the truth. You'll always find somebody who's better than you or always find somebody who's worse than you, but it'll always leave you messed up. You'll say, I wish I could be them. And then you're striving to be somebody. And in truth, be there if they're doing the same thing, striving to be somebody else. So you're trying to be somebody you've never even met. You're trying to be somebody you never could be. Or you're looking at somebody and saying, oh, I'm okay because I'm not as bad as that person. And then you get comfortable and complacent. Uh, I've said this quote, I'll give it to you again. If you're coasting spiritually through life or coasting anywhere in life, you need to understand something about coasting. Coasting is never making progress. Coasting often is going downhill. And so if you're saying, I've reached a place where I'm okay, beware. Matter of fact, isn't this the word that, that we get through the scriptures in New Testament? Take heed, lest you fall. All right, the thing is, is you're, you're not ever in your spiritual walk going to be at a place where you can just say, let's put this thing in neutral. We've got it from here. No, we're always, always progressing towards Christ. Paul said, well, this one thing I'm doing, I'm, I'm striving. I haven't achieved it. But I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to measure up, paraphrasing, to who Jesus is. All right? So understand this. I, I know a lot of people that walk around with their head in the air. I call them modern-day Pharisees. They think they're good because they don't have your sin. But they do have their own. And they have forgotten that their own sin made them fall short of the glory of God too. But God's glory and God's grace has made us equal in Christ. Brothers and sisters, isn't that a good thing? Nobody in this room is better than the other. And because I'm standing here today does not make me a higher standing than you. We're not going to get to heaven and, and, and God grant us reward based on our positions. We're going to get to heaven and God is going to judge our works. All right, understand this. It's what you do for God. There's a lot of things that happened this week that you never saw. A lot of things that took place that I think are way more important than what I'm doing right now. Because if I, I just stood here and did it without them doing what they do, some of you would be too distracted to even hear the message. I believe the greeter is just as important as the preacher. I've always said it, 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 ministry starts outside the walls way more than it ever happens in the walls. 
And if we're waiting on a service to make us rally around the gospel and rally to the truth, we're really messed up and we're really in trouble. The church has never saved the first person, but the blood of Jesus Christ has rescued everyone. And I think we need to get back to that. And while that's not my message, it's leading into a segue that I think has made the church in a very dangerous situation. Because even when the disciples came back, they looked at him and said, why are you talking to a woman? Like, what's going on? Because they were so embedded in their religion that they truly didn't even know what they believed. And so in our teenagers for the past two weeks, we've taken on very hard topics and those I'm not going to go into today. But we're really, God's convicted me because I believe in our lives that we are trying to build ideas instead of actual belief systems. And so today, we're going to look at those two words. Ready? If I've ever titled one, Travis, I'm going to give you a bonus. I'm going to title my own sermon today. Ready? Belief systems. I want you to get this. When Jesus said, come and said, give me the drink. She said, you're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me? That's a, that's a great question. I don't know about you, but I felt that way with God sometimes. Like, God... You know, my, you know my testimony, right? Why are you calling me? Why are you asking me to do this for you? And some of you need to understand that I, I believe that echoes going in, in, into the halls of your heart too, where God is showing up and you're expecting God to give you something when God's actually not showing up to give you anything, but to call you to give back to him from what he's already given you. And he's looking at her and Jesus says, give me a drink. She says, why are you asking me? You know, I, I, I'll tell you this right now. I think a lot of us get stuck right there in the conversation and we don't let it progress. We get stuck in the whole, I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. I'm this, I'm that. Or, or, or we start thinking, well, I don't want to talk to that person. I know what that person did. Or, or why would God call me there? And, you know, I don't like going around homeless people because they gross me out. And that's not my belief. But I've heard people say that. And, 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 and I've, I've been at churches where they say, well, we don't want to run our buses because we don't want to bring that type to the church. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I mean, you can't tell me you have the heartbeat of God if you don't like the dirty. You, you can't tell me you have the heartbeat of God if you don't like the broken. And by the way, you can't tell me you love Jesus if you run every time somebody makes a mistake. You can't tell me that you love him. And call it browbeating or whatever you want. I'm just sick and tired of the church playing church on Sundays and then going out and living like the world every other day. I'm so tired of them acting like they're religious, putting on the right things and singing the right songs and raising their hand at the right time. But then when somebody is actually in need, they have nothing to give. When somebody's actually hurting, they turn their back. Hey, Galatians teaches us, Ephesians teaches us, Romans and Paul have taught us that when somebody falls, Corinthians, he tells them, restore that person so that they're not overcome by grief. In Galatians, he says, hey, if someone stumbles, you help them up. But make sure you don't fall into sin too. I think sometimes I've heard people misuse that and they're like, well, this person fell into uh, thievery and if I try to help them, then I'm going to become a thief or I'm good because I'm not becoming the thief that they are. The Bible's not talking about the same sin. Get it out of your head. Sin is sin. Sin is sin. Say it with me. Ready? Sin is sin. He's not talking about you doing the same thing they did. He's talking about the temptation you're going to have when you find out their dirt to go gossip. Hey, when you're trying to help somebody else up, don't fall into sin by saying, did you know what so-and-so did? When you're trying to help somebody else up, don't fall into sin by standing back and judging them and saying, well, I'm better than that person. See, hey, listen, when you are helping someone up, you have to stay humble and realize that it's only by the grace of God you are where you are today. It's only by the grace of God you're happy. It's only by the grace of God you have joy. It's only by the grace of God that any of us can stand and give a testimony of his goodness. It's by his grace and his grace alone we have been saved. And nothing else, nothing else has done that. And so may we never forget where we've come from. So that when we meet somebody down and low, we don't take a high head and a high road. Instead, like a good Samaritan, we bandage wounds right on the spot. We meet them right where they are. I'd rather have five of you in this church and that be all we have that cared about people than to have hundreds that only cared about themselves. I, I think we've got to get to a church where we realize you've got to answer this question for you and you alone. Why do you believe 
what you believe. Why do you believe in the God you say you believe in? Why? Not just simply because I preached it and you heard it or somebody else preached it and you heard it or my grandmother always went to church. That's not good enough. We, we've got to get into a realization that we're not building our belief systems on what everybody else around us believes. That's why we're in trouble today. I mean, I'm going to get a little bit real here. There's more people attending church today worldwide than are protesting in streets. And yet we never hear what's happening in the church. We always hear about what's happening in the street. That's a problem. There's more Christians going to worship God today than there are people burning down other buildings. And yet we hear nothing about what God's done in churches. That's a problem. It's because a lot of us, I believe this, and I wrote this statement in my notes, most of us have built our lives, our belief systems on teaching or coaching or, or, or churching, if you want to call it that, counseling, recovery programs, and everything we believe is based on everything that's teaching us to change the way we behave. But Jesus did something totally radical here that I have missed for years and I'm going to bring out to you. As Jesus came to her and he replied in verse number 10, if you only, let's say the word, knew. If you only knew this gift that God has for you and who you were speaking to, you would ask of me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope in a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would we get the living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than the ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he did, than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks of this water will soon become thirsty, verse 14. But those who drink of the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Verse 15, please, sir. The woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again. And here is where she hasn't got it yet. And I won't have to come here to get water. See, here's the thing. You see a spiritual God, Jesus, approaching a woman who has bad behavior. Matter of fact, keep reading. Go and get your husband. And not that what Jesus said? I love the twist. We haven't even talked about this man. We, don't, we haven't even talked about her life. And when she's not getting it, and he's saying, I want to spiritually heal you, I want to spiritually satisfy you, she's saying, okay, I'll take what physically you can give. I want my needs met. I want my wants met. I need my life to change. And he's saying, hey, I want to give you something spiritual. But she's saying, I need something physical. And her lifestyle had amplified that. And everything that she had done, been married five times, living with somebody that wasn't her husband. And he's saying, hey, I want to heal you. And she's saying, hey, I just want to feel okay right now. I want life to be easier. Anybody else in here say me too? I mean, we've done that, right? She's like, if you did that, I wouldn't have to come back to this well. I mean, we don't understand the magnitude of what it was like to go to the well, right? Because we just turn on a faucet or we stick our cup up against the refrigerator or we open a cool chest and we get out a bottled water and we pour it out. We don't understand what it was like to take pots and vessels and tie them all to ropes and put them onto sticks and to walk maybe sometimes miles just to get water enough for the day. Water enough for the moment. And when somebody comes in and says, you'll never be thirsty again, you know what she's saying? I'll never have to carry this load again. And you know what I had, what hit me very hard, as I believe a lot of people come to church asking God to take the load. When God's saying, hey, you need to carry the load. I mean, that, that, that's going to satisfy what I'm wanting to do in your life. You need to still carry the water. You're still going to have to go to the well. You're still going to have to physically take care of yourself. But I'm here to help free you of a spiritual load that is way too heavy for you to carry by yourself. I'm here to help change something in you that has kept you so trapped and imprisoned for so long. Please write this down. Jesus did not care about her behavior. He didn't come after her to change the way she behaved. He came after her to change the way she believed. 
And he's saying, hey, you're believing in men. You're believing in yourself. And you're putting all your effort into that. And it's making this behavior. Jesus knew, and I think the church needs to wake up and know too, that we spend a lot of times in our coaching and our teaching and our programming trying to work on people's behavior. And then our minds are blown when their behavior won't change. Our minds are blown when they go back to it. If you've worked in recovery ministry, you get 30 to 60 days before most people return back to their habit. Am I right? And you sit there and you think to yourself, what did I do wrong? And I have prayed over that and labored over that again and again and again. It's no secret that addicts are my heartbeat. It is no secret that I love broken people. I mean, that, that literally, I would take a church full of broken people than a church full of people that had it all together. People that have it all together freak me out. Anybody else? I mean, you can't be happy all the time. You can have joy all the time. But joy isn't a smile on the face telling jokes and bubbly. Joy is a constant belief that it's going to be okay even when things are difficult. And I'm going to tell you now that there's joy in my heart, but sometimes life is hard. Anybody scream me too? Yeah, so understand this. That we look at this and the church says, behave. Behave. You know how many times I've heard in church, and thank God y'all don't do this to me. You know how many times I've heard in church that people shouldn't behave this way. I mean, you shouldn't, I mean, I've heard it all. You shouldn't chew gum in church. I was looking around to see how many jaws stopped as soon as I said that. How many of you have heard that before? Don't chew gum in church. Okay, that's old school, right? That's why, by the way, they, why is the gum under the seat? Because you told me not to chew it. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to swallow it because you told me I have to hold it seven years if I do that. So I can't chew it. I can't swallow it. I'm going to give it as an offering. <laughs> you know, like, here it is. All to Jesus, I surrender. I'm going to get right with God today. Get rid of my gum. Anyway, sorry. I've heard you shouldn't run. I believe that I, I, I've had somebody one time tell me, I'll never come back to your church because you allow gangs. He's like, we got a gang in our church. I got so excited. That's so awesome. <laughs> like, how cool is it that they would come and be in a place like this? And he was like, no, you've got this teenager that sits on the second row and wears this hat sideways. You shouldn't wear hats in church. And I'm like, man, you know what? I, be I bet God's going to be so proud of you when you stand before him and say, he went to hell because I told him he couldn't wear a hat. Do you think God's going to be honored by that? Absolutely not. And so we say, you've got to behave. I'll be honest with you, when I'm parenting, if I'm not careful, I'm focused more on correcting their behavior. And here it is, collecting, correcting their belief system. All right, understand this. Bad behavior, write it down, comes from bad belief system. And when my belief system is off, guaranteed my behaviors are. Matter of fact, we get this equation. When lust has conceived, right? We, we told our teenagers this. By the way, I'm going to give it to you. You know what lust is born from. Lust is not just sexual. Lust is anytime you're enticed to sin, whether it's a lie, gossip, or anything. Anytime you've lusted, you've desired. What happens is the tempter shows up with something he knows you desire. And when desires and temptation are allowed to last, lust is born. And when lust is born and then given thought, of, I might want to do that. All right, so temptation and desire come together. Lust. Got it? Nod with me. Lust and idea come together. Sin. And when sin is finished, death. And not you drop over dead, but you lose a part of yourself. Adam and Eve experienced death the moment they bit the fruit. It wasn't that they physically died, but in that moment, their confidence was gone. In that moment, their ability to stand before God with a head held high was gone. In that moment, everything they knew was gone, and they went into hiding, and they sewed leaves together, and they tried to do temporary fixes, and they tried to figure out how they could do this, how they could still look at each other, how could they love each other, how could they be pleasing to God. They freaked out. You know what that is? Death. 
And in your life, when our actions and sins, when they come together and they produce sin, the result of that is there's a guiltiness, a brokenness, a shame. There's something that Satan puts on you. The tempter becomes the accuser, and the accuser then becomes an abuser. And the next thing you know, you feel like you can't be anything. You can't do anything. You don't deserve your wife. You don't deserve your kids. You don't deserve your life. You don't deserve the love of God. How many times have you heard people say, I can't go to church the ceiling would fall in. I can't go to church. The walls would burn down. Have you heard that before? You know what they are? They are trapped in a belief system born from the enemy. And when Jesus showed up at the well, thank God, he didn't say, you need to behave. He said, you need to believe. If you only knew, if you only knew, And I've learned in my life, and I'm going to challenge you, and this is why I said take notes, because it might not just be for you. It might be for somebody else. You may be the worst behaved person in the world or know somebody that's the worst behaved person. Stop trying to tackle their behavior. Stop trying to fix everything you do. Guys, I know some of your stories. I don't know them all, but I'll tell you this, and I want to speak right to you and others of you that are sitting in the room. I want you to understand that the world will say, stop using, stop saying, stop stealing, stop doing. And you're sitting there saying, well, I really want to stop doing that. But if you only work on your behaviors, you'll either pick up new habits that are bad or the old habits will come back because your behavior is not your problem. My little girl and my little boys, they're, they're, they're not bad. Would you agree with me? The kids are a blessing, all right, that they're a gift. Yeah, but they have to be trained, right? They have to be taught. They don't know the stove is hot. You know, they, they, they don't. My, my little boy, my nine-year-old, eight-year-old does not know that it's dangerous to just run away from home. He sees an adventure. He has to be taught. Some of you are 37, 38, 40, 50. Let's stop there. Right? Some of you are highly invested in your life when it comes to time. Right? And yet you're still trying to fix your behaviors, trying to figure out what's wrong with you. And I know that in our churches, a lot of times, and I do it too, we we preach a lot on behavior. You know, we, we talk about this is what you should do. But what you should do will not change your life until you believe it will. And without belief, anything you do is worthless. How many of you understand so far where we're at? I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I feel impelled while I'm on the stage. Garrett, can you do me a favor? Richie, can you help him? In that room is a dry erase board. Can you bring it to me? I don't know how we can do this to where everybody can see. I know online you may suffer from being able to see, and I apologize in advance. But I want to show you something that we are taught in this passage that I've really never even heard preached. Jesus looks at her and he says, hey, If you knew, you would ask me to drink. I I wrote down some things, and this is what my notes look like, just so you know. I wrote down some things, and and, and I want you to get these too. As we're working on behaviors, and as we're working on people, and as we're looking at this, the number one thing we need to find out is why is this, whatever it is, happening to you? Why does this keep happening? What is it in you that maybe you're hurt or hung up by. I mean, a lot of people, I don't know about you, thank you guys. A lot of people treat other people poorly because of something going on in a relationship that has nothing to do with the other person. I've used the illustration before. How many of you have had a bad day at work and your family got the brunt of it, right? How many of you got cut off in traffic and ended up screaming on the phone at somebody that didn't cut you off, that didn't produce your bad day? Why is that? Your behaviors are influenced by what you believe. Some of you hate people today, and you don't want to call it hate because we're trained in church not to hate. But let's be honest, we should hate sin, and we should hate what the enemy's doing to people. Would you agree with that? And I, I, I don't like the fact that people are hurting and struggling today. But what I have found in my life, and I am a great artist, so just stay with me. I don't want to make anybody jealous today, all right? I have found in my life that a lot of what I believed in my life through time, Casey, are you up there? 
All right, come on, bring your phone. Can you throw it, throw it up here on the screen? All right, we're going to do that. Now, don't be distracting. Just make it happen. I'm going to keep going, okay? We'll try to get this on there. But I've learned in my life that a lot of what I believed and a lot of what I built my life on was things that I was taught. How many of you say me too? All right. One plus one? Did you, were you born with that? If so, man, you should be very successful. All right. Um, anything times zero equals what? I remember the first time I was told that. And I know now, being older, some of you are like, that was so elementary. When I first heard that, I was like, but how? It's still a three, right? And three times zero, I should have three. I remember arguing it. The logic means if I start with three and I multiply it times zero, there's still three in the equation. How are you telling me this means zero? I remember that, all right. But they told me three times zero equals, so guess what, I believe it. Are you following me? I remember being told that uh, a man should never wear shorts. I don't believe that anymore, but I did. I remember being told that I should never date a woman who wears pants. I'll never forget telling somebody in high school, I can't date you, you wear pants. And watching that person bawl their eyes out, walking away. You know why? I was told it. I believed it. And so what happened is, is I'm finding ground to stand on, and my ground that I'm standing on is what people told me. I remember being in high school in 11th grade and my coach called to play in basketball. I always have loved basketball and, 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 and I thought it was dumb, so I didn't run it. You know what ended up happening? There was a timeout called and on the way to the bench, I heard every word of discouragement that could possibly come out of somebody's mouth in a very loud decimal with a lot of spit showering me. As he walked me all the way to the end of the bench. And he said, this is where you're staying. Until you learn how to listen when I call a play. You know why I didn't run his play? I didn't believe in it. I thought my way would work. And so he called a play called high, where we go to the high box. We go to the outside free throw line extended. And we were going to run this and we were going to do this. But I thought I can beat my guy. I was very quick at that point in life, and I was a lot less of me, all right? And I, I could move a ball pretty fast. Right now, if I tried it, I'd blow out my left knee, and it'd be over. But I knew I had a skill that my defender did not have. And so I, in my mind, determined, all right, come up here. I determined that I was going to set low up, which means you take your player one-on-one. -on -one. And so I set up the play low, and I start driving, and I start trying to take my guy, and I get fancy, and I do a crossover, and the ball doesn't meet my other hand and goes all the way back the other end of the court to where their guys beat me to it and score a layup. For those of you that don't know, I turned the ball over because my way was better. And you know what I realize now, as I'm older, um, the guy didn't beat me, I beat myself. You know why? Because the coach saw something I didn't see, but because I didn't believe in him, I believed in me. And because I believed in me, I messed up the play. Are you following me? Let me flip this on you. God's word is very clear on a lot of things. Very clear on a lot of things that in our society, we just turn our back to it's not popular, so we don't want to talk about it. It goes against culture, so we don't want to teach on it. And if somebody does or somebody says something, here, point it at the ground until I'm ready for you. That way they don't get distracted all the way down. If somebody, if somebody doesn't like it, we're not going to say it. And I have found this to be true, that a lot of people are building their entire belief system off of other people's ideas while the church is over here when we should be saying, on Christ the solid rock, on the word of God, on his truth and his word alone, this is what works. This is the play to run. This is the play to believe in. This is how you raise your family. This is how you teach your church. This is what you do. But we're so scared that if we start building a foundational belief system that people will leave. And the truth is, in the last times, they will. They'll be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. You know, I don't even like preaching like this because we'll probably be 10 or 20 people lower next Sunday. Because if we start coming in here and saying, hey, CNN and Fox should not decide who you vote for. I'll say this to my dying breath. 
I don't think politicians are the most honest people. So I don't vote politician. I vote my belief system. And I stand on my belief system. And I don't let them tell me what my belief system should be. I believe a life is a life when God decides that to be a life. It is not a life when you determine it has a heartbeat. And so therefore I stand on it. And I say, this is what I believe. I told my wife the other day, I don't know where this song got in my head, but I kept singing, I love rock and roll. Put another ju- a quarter in the jukebox, baby. My little girl looks at me and goes, what are you singing about, daddy? And, and I know that's not, you may say I take it too far. But I stood there and I'm like, I'm not explaining that to her. Because I don't, I don't want her to build her life on that. What are you singing about, daddy? And I realized, oh, around those ears, I should be singing about Jesus. How he loves her. I should be setting a foundation of her belief system, even in my music. And you may say that's too far. I've learned this with my daughter. I only have so far I get to take her. And then she peeks up from there. And I work with teenagers a lot. I have for a lot of years. And I'm learning that more and more teenagers have nowhere to pick up. And cutting in our teenage youth is out of control. And our little girls are getting manipulated. (laughs) And our little boys are so quiet. And I'll say this, we got some really good guys in our youth group. We spend a lot of time with them. Some of the questions they ask and some of the things that they're looking for, I'm I'm stepping back and I'm saying, okay, God, as a church, what foundation are we building? What are we teaching? What are we showing? Are we entertaining Christians to the point to where they cannot raise their own families because all they know about church is how to have fun? Should church be fun? Yes. But does fun stay constant in your life? Oh, our water day event next week will be fun. But it's not going to relieve the deep pain of some of the kids that are coming to it. Because as soon as the water balloons stop, as soon as the, the water turns off on the water slide, they go back to the home that they're getting beat in. They go back To the place I asked our teenage boys about a month ago. How many of you on a daily basis witness yelling and screaming in your home? And almost every single one of them raised their hand. And I've realized that in our lives, if we're all honest in this room, the models that we have seen of how to have a good relationship, some of you have had great ones, but the majority of us have not had such good relationship models. Amen? And if we build our belief systems on what people tell us, then we'll believe that all men are pigs and women are cheaters and they're nagging because the belief system of the world wants to divide us from the truth that you can have a very strong marriage and not be perfect in it if you have a foundation to believe on. You know why most divorces are happening in Christianity? Because divorce is a belief system in the marriage. And if we step back and said, I ain't leaving. No, we're not talking about your abusive situations. We're not talking about the person that's continually unfaithful without repentance. But I'm simply saying this. And I want you to grab it. Lean in and get hold of this. If it's an option, it'll eventually be a reality. And if you believe that if things get bad enough, you can bail... You're going to bail. You know what Paul said when the ship was sinking? He went to the guys and he said to them, hey, cut the ropes to the lifeboat. 
Why cut the ropes to the lifeboat? Because if we get in the lifeboats, we're going to die. So we're going to either stay on this ship or we're going to get out there and die. So cut the escape out and let's go forward. We live in a generation who is not learning how to resolve their conflicts, to resolve their differences. How many of you have been married more than 20 years? Raise your hand. I know you're up there. All right. Look around. I want you to, I want you to scope these people. More than 20 years. How many of you still have fights? <laughs> Norman and Frida dropped their hands, looked at each other. And the Norman behind our hand raises his hand. <laughs> that was good. How many of you have believed in God for more than 20 years of your life? Raise your hand. Amen. How many of you still sin? You catching on? Look at this. Let's read. Casey, I, I promise we're going to go there. First thing we need to figure out is why they're behaving this way. I mean, what is rooted in your life? What is going on? Everybody else will judge your behaviors. If you let them treat your behaviors, you'll, you'll be back at the doctor. Because that will come back up. Is there a hurt? There's a hang up. Number two, we need to figure out why there is a need for a change. I'll tell you right now, Derek and Chessa could look at my life and say he needs to change this. But until I believe I need to change it, does it matter what they think? The church can look at the world and say they need a change. But if they don't believe they need to change, then will they ever? You know why hate screams the loudest? Because it carries the most hurt. And a lot of times people that are deep rooted in hurt, I see pain when I watch the news. I, I see people who are rooted. We had Libby talk in front of our, our, our teenage girls as we talked about same sex relationships this past Wednesday. And yes, we do take those on. And if you're mad at us as a family for taking on same sex relationships and you're going to pull your kids out of the church, then you might as well withdraw them from school. Because they're teaching them their version. And the thing is, is if you don't want them taught, that's up to you. But don't bring them here. Because we're going to bring the word in and we're going to sit down and we're going to look. She made a statement that was very, very deep and very meaningful. 35 years in the, that lifestyle, am I correct, Libby? Huh? 30 years. And, and, and said, I remember the moment I made the choice. And then the question was asked, have you ever loved a man? Can I tell a little bit of your story? Just a little bit. She said, I was married to one that made me feel like I was worthless. I was nothing. You know what he did? He built a belief system in her mind. And if you think for a moment Satan's not trying to build belief systems in your mind, you're sadly mistaken and you're very blind. You ever been in a room when you were feeling insecure, saw somebody whispering and thought they were talking about you? You have a belief system. You ever walked into a meeting that you were called into ready to go, mad and ready to go? Because you thought you knew why they called the meeting? You had a belief system. Were you ever 16 years old thinking that your parents' curfew was dumb? You had a belief system. Now, well, don't raise your hand. Did you ever sneak out of the window because of that? Did you ever date the person that no, they told you not to date? Did you ever go, Jordan, to the movies, leave your car, get in somebody else's car, and go somewhere you weren't supposed to be? She calls me out almost every Sunday when I'm preaching, so I'm like, there's my moment to just get her back. <laughs> it's because you had a belief system. And how many of you have found that those belief systems hurt you? That there was a reason they said don't date him or her. There's a reason they said don't go there. There's a reason they try to stop you, but your belief system, you believed in. And because you believed in it, you acted on it. And then your actions produced reactions. Sometimes those reactions are good things, right? When you're kind to people, the reaction is typically what? Kindness. When you're loving, the reaction is typically what? Loving. 
But when you're a drug addict or an alcoholic or you have abused and you've done things that you shouldn't do, the reactions are normally what? Consequences. And I've lived those. I'm not calling you out. I'm just talking from my experience. But I literally had times in my life that I believed alcohol would make me feel better. And I would drink until I was numb so that I wouldn't feel the hate that was burning in my heart towards my father. I would drink because I thought it made me funny. I could go to a bar and be a part of a crowd with a fifth of tequila in me. It made me feel like I could just be open and free. Why? I had a belief system. I believed so much that alcohol made me the person I dreamed to be instead of leaving me in the hurts that I felt every single day. So instead of fixing the belief system where the hurt lied, I just went after behavior. And we find Jesus standing, looking at a woman that says, it's not about your behavior, sweetie. You only knew what you should know and believe in. Your life would be better. Are y'all still with me today? At any moment, if you need to leave, you can go. But I feel a very great heaviness towards this sermon today. That I need to finish it. He looks at her and read this verse with me, if you would. She said, I don't have a husband. The woman replied, and Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have five husbands, and you aren't married. Even married to the man you're living with now, you certainly spoke the truth. There's something good that happens when you tell God the truth. I'm just going to tell you that. There's a freedom that happens when you just tell the truth. I long to create a church that doesn't come in with people that have the great worship where they're dancing and hands in the air, although I'd love for you to do that. I, I long to create the church that people can come in and scream from the back row of a balcony, I am hurting and I need help, and know that they weren't going to be judged. That a husband can stand and confess his deepest, darkest secret to his wife in the middle of a place where they would be surrounded by love and to where it would become our belief system and anthem to not let their marriage fail. To where somebody could hit an altar and say, I'm addicted, I'm stuck, I'm this, I'm that, and the other. And instead of us going out and saying, can you believe that judge? Can you believe that lawyer? Can you believe that person that's locked all those people up has their own problem? To where we don't care where they've been or who they are, but we care about where they are right now and the fact that they need a better thing to believe in than what they've had before. You certainly spoke the truth, sir, the woman said. You must be a prophet. Tell me why it is that you Jews insist That Jerusalem is the only place of worship while uh, Samaritans claim that it's here on Mount Gerizim. What a shift in conversation. I mean, we're talking about, you're sleeping around. And all of a sudden, it shifts to, this is where I worship. And why is it you say I should worship in Jerusalem? Where this is my place. Aren't you, oh, write this down. I love the fact that Jesus didn't just meet her in the place of her sin. He met her in the place of her worship too. That's the place she went to get to God. And what she didn't realize and what some of you sitting in this very room didn't realize today is you went to a place where you were going to worship God, not realizing that God came to the place of your worship to meet with you and to tell you there's way more that you have offered through Christ than you've received. And I love the place. I love it. Not only did he tear down her belief system, he tore down those barriers that worship sometimes creates. And he says this, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. You think he's qualified to say that when he's the God that she's been wanting to worship standing in front of her saying, you don't know very much about worship because if you knew, you would know who's standing in front of you right now. You know, that statement made me realize we don't know as much about God as we pretend to. Because if we did, maybe we wouldn't be so scared of what's going on in the world around us right now. If we did, maybe we wouldn't be so confused by what everybody else is saying about us right now. 
Time is coming, verse 23. Indeed, it is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Two references I want you to write down. Ready? Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. You got them? Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, Matthew chapter number 22, verse 37. Deuteronomy is Moses speaking, and he said, you must love the Lord your God, right? With, with all your, your body, all right? Your soul, and he uses the word might, strength. Jesus in Matthew 22 said, love the Lord your God with your body, your soul, and your mind. Moses said, be strong. And Jesus said, believe. Moses said, hey, we've got to do these sacrifices and we've got to worship because that's the way of salvation in Moses' day because Jesus hadn't died. And Jesus said, hey, you got to love him with your body, the way you act. you got to love him with, with your soul, all right? But you got to love him with your mind, your belief system. And so I found this to be true. The wise person built his house on the rock. A foolish person on the sand. Too many people are building their belief about God on the ideas of others. And for so long, they have tapped into every sermon, every book that they could possibly read, and they believe because they read it or they heard it somewhere. And I'm telling you, that day needs to stop in your life. If I believed everything I believed about God by the way I was raised, many of you and and myself, we would not be able to come together. My own grandfather stopped talking to me for over a decade because I started a non-denominational church. And and, and, and I'm sitting here thinking to myself, do you think we're going to get to heaven and God say, okay, Baptist, where are you at? Or do you think we're going to get to heaven and he's say, where were my believers at? We're the ones that accepted my son, who accepted my love and accepted my sacrifices. Write it down if you've never heard it. You're not going to get to heaven based on where you were baptized. And you're not going to get to heaven based on where your membership is. You're not even going to get to heaven based on what you've done and haven't done. The only way you're going to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. It's not up to you. To figure out what salvation is, it's for you to believe, to believe, to build a base system, a belief system that Jesus is the only way. In the past two years of my life, I've had many people tell me you're not saved because you did this or this and that and the other and this and that and the other and this and that and the other. And it literally for maybe weeks or months put me in this tailspin of am I saved? And then I got to this point where I realized in the word of God that my salvation is not based on what they believe that I deserve. It is based on what God gave me through Jesus Christ. And therefore, I want to give it to you. If you didn't earn it and you didn't build it and you didn't make it, you don't own it. Salvation is not yours and mine to own. It belongs to God because of what Jesus did. And if God owns it, I can't sell it. I can't trade it. I can't buy it. I can't do anything. It is not mine. It's his. And when God gives you your salvation, he keeps the rights to it. You're not even powerful enough to take away God's grace for you. And that is a freeing way to live. So the Bible gives us this, and I remember my counselor, I walked in one day, and he drew this circle, and on this circle, he broke down the mind, the soul, the body, the mind, soul, the body, and your heart. In the midst of your heart, in the middle of you, every decision you make, everything you do in your life is based on what you believe in these three areas of your life. And so when Jesus said, you are to love the Lord your God with all your soul, what is your soul? It's the spiritual side of you that is eternal. It lasts forever. I'll never forget him coming in and him writing in the middle of the soul. This is where your salvation takes place. 
This is where your calling, your service. This is where God meets with you. This is where we encounter Jesus is through a belief in our soul that God has eternal rights to my life. Do you know what he did? He looked at me and he said, and here's your problem. Instead of putting Christ in the center, when you accept him into your heart, you keep Christ in your soul while trying to keep total control for yourself of your mind and your body. He said, and as a result, you feel certain things in your mind. You feel a little bit inferior, less than everybody else. Anybody ever felt that in this room? You feel a little bit inadequate. I'm just going to leave it there. In other words, you don't feel like you're good enough to accomplish these things in your life. Anybody else ever felt like that? You ever felt like even on your best day as a mom, you're still not a good mom? Your best days as a dad, you still feel like that again. I mean, come on, raise your hand. How many of you have felt those two things right there? I'm inferior, I'm less than everybody else, inadequate, I'm not good enough. If we're honest in some area of our lives, most of us hit there. And you know what he said? Anytime you're feeling these things, you're in control. Here it is, very real. Your belief system is built on you. And what happens is, when I'm in control of my mind, my body carries out the action. Did you know that your body has actual natural reactions to anxiety? How many of you have ever had an anxiety headache? You were so anxious that you got a headache. How many of you have ever had what you would consider a panic attack? Anybody else a sleepless night? What about fantasy? And not fantasy like the world talks about. Fantasy where you just think everybody's out to get you. You think everybody hates you. You know what's happening? If you're loving the Lord in your soul because I believe that he died and he loves me and he's going to save me from my sins, but I'm scared to surrender in my mind and I'm scared to give in my body. And some of you in this very room, you know that everything you've had in life, you thought you had to make. Anybody else in here ever have that thing that if you don't do it, it won't be good enough. It won't be done right. That if you're not taking care of your kids, then they ain't no babysitter that's going to be able to care about them like you. And that's probably true. But you don't date and you don't go out and you don't have fun because you're so scared that if you surrender for a moment, that their life is going to come crashing down. Understand this. You and I could never be enough God for anybody. Ever. And even in our best efforts, if we try to hold somebody else's life together, their life's eventually going to fall apart because we cannot be what they believe in. This very church had that. At some point, we believe so much more in our pastor than God. That when our pastor fell, he fell apart. Our belief system can't be what comes from the stage. It's got to be what comes from heaven. And I've heard people look at each other and say, I can't live without you. You know what a healthy way to get in your marriage is? I can live without you, but I really don't want to. Because with or without you, I have my heavenly father. With or without my friendships, I still have a God that loves me and a brother named Jesus. And a Holy Spirit that comforts and stays with me. We got to get to a place in our life that our confidence isn't built on what everybody else has to say. And what happens is our body starts actually showing the things. We start overeating. We start hurting. We start having cramps. We, matter of fact, they say this, 83% of the diseases in our world come from stress. 83%. And when we look at that and we start thinking that and we start realizing that, hey, when we are not controlling what's going on in us and we're trying to be the one to figure it all out and instead of saying, I believe, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or when we don't have a foundational belief that says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me. Please remember this. God didn't wake you up this morning saying, this is the day I want you to fail. He didn't wake you up this morning with the idea of this is the day he's going to fail you. 
No, like David said, this is the day the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it. You say, well, you don't know how bad that person's hurt me or you don't know what's going on. Stop making it your belief system. Stop believing that what they've been is what they always have to be. I am so sick and tired of hearing that people don't change. The reality is this. I believe God in one moment changed a lot of people's lives in the word of God. Don't you? Anytime they encounter Jesus, would you believe there's a radical change? Why? Because Jesus didn't try to change any behavior. You go through the scripture and tell me one time when he healed somebody, set somebody free, or when they accepted Christ, that he focused on their behavior. He didn't every single time. He said, believe in me. Follow me. Hey, abandon what you know. Get into the boat with me. Let's go to the other side. Watch this. Do this. Believe this. My father's like this. When you pray, pray like this. It wasn't, hey, stop sinning, stop sinning, stop sinning. It was, hey, start believing, start believing, start believing, because what you believe will affect what you do. And most of us keep Christ on our Sunday morning schedule. We keep Christ on a five-minute devotional on the way to work. Our relationship with Christ goes as far as how long we can listen to K-Love on the way to work. And it goes no further. And we're wondering why we keep coming back to the same well. Keep feeling the same way. Now, I'm going to take a very bold step of faith. It's because our belief systems are messed up. How many of you have heard me quote a thousand times? Choose today who you will, but as for, we will serve. Don't you know we leave a little part out? He says, are you going to serve the gods of these people and the gods of these people? I mean, this God was a failure. We just conquered them. And this God, that's their God of provision. And we now own all their stuff. I mean, I love how Joshua, when he actually attacked their gods, was saying, their God of provision, their God of presence, all these gods that they believe in, we now own. So do you really want to serve this? And some of us believe that if we were 20 pounds lighter, our spouses would love us more. Some of us believe that if you looked a certain way, he would stop watching pornography. We believe that if we did a little bit more, then maybe our kids wouldn't mess up like they do. We believe we have to be in control because if we're not, they'll lose control. And we're building a belief system that is destined to fail. Can I say this? And I don't mean this hurtful. 20 pounds less or not until he decides to get right in his own heart, your body's not going to change him. perfect celebrate recovery program or not until they decide to put their hope and faith in Jesus and deal with the hurts and hangups of their lives. Their addictions won't change. Jesus showed up at the well and said, believe. And we show up to church and say, you got to do, do, do. When we go back to the verse that talks about revival, and I'm almost done. And we're in Chronicles, it tells us if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves, seek my face, return, turn from their wicked ways, and pray, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. In there, he's not saying, Hey, he's saying believe enough to change your behavior. I'm a firm believer that if you knew how much God loved you, a lot of the things we do and say would not be done and would not be said. Would you agree? By the way, when the mind and the body are in your control, it starts turning into hostility inside we break, frustrated. How many of you get frustrated at yourself more than you ever get frustrated with somebody else? Raise your hand. Come on. That's me. A lot of times my wife will say, why are you mad? I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at me. I'm mad at me. But by the way, frustration at yourself still comes out on other people. You know what hostility leads to? It, it leads to retaliation. And this is where addiction comes from. 
and this is where affair comes from, and this is where all those things that we could just list that you've done, that you say, how could I have done this? And you're trying to figure out why you did what you did. It's not based on why you did it. It's based on what you believed. And you believed that this would ease your pain. You believed that this would make you feel like somebody. You believed that this would take away what's going on inside of your own heart and your own mind. You believed it would make you better. And it didn't. I'm calling on our church today to answer that question. Why do you believe what you believe? Because you've got to start with God and establish your faith. I told our teenagers this, and I'll close. You either got to believe God or don't. You've got to decide. I believe God or I don't. There's not a middle ground. What's the Bible even say? God would rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm. Why? Because the lukewarm it gets spewed. I mean, there, there's, there's nothing positive that happens here. And if you have said today that you believe God, you've got to take his total truth, not just the parts you want. We've got to believe what God says about things, church. And whether it brings us under persecution, yesterday me and my wife had a conversation as another church in America was burnt to the ground, saying this is coming, it's more and more. And when we choose to stand and say that, hey, listen, we love you, But God's design for your life was not to live in this world mindset that is tearing you apart. God's design is to live here. Therefore, we have to, by God's word, say, this is wrong, all right? This is right. This is wrong. You've got to believe. You can't believe. You've got to build it. You've got to have a foundation. And he said two words, and I'll close with this. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit means your body, mind, and soul. Truth means your belief system. How many of you are still with me? You ready? One more thing, we're out. A lot of people only want to worship God in spirit. You know what this is? Emotional. They, they're excited about God when the atmosphere around them is excited. So when I worship God in spirit but not in truth, I get emotional with my worship. And it's the equivalent of a high that as soon as the high wears off, the worship ends. When I worship God in truth, but not in spirit, I can very much become legalistic. You know what legalism is? Where I'm beating you up with my ideas. Well, this, thus saith the Lord, boom, bomb, no compassion, no care. And God says we need believers that worship in spirit. That's what he told him. And truth to where we come to God and say, because of what I believe, I can worship God always. And know that God will sustain us. And I believe we live in a generation of churches, you examine them, that are either all hype and emotion or all legalism. And we're not experiencing the church that says, This is what we believe. He's a good God, a good Father, and we worship from there. How many of you have a testimony of God's deliverance in your life? How many of you have a true testimony of deliverance in your life? Stand up where you are. You got a true testimony of God's deliverance in your life. You've seen God do amazing things, whether it be through your marriage, your habits, the different things of your life, maybe finances. You got a true testimony. If we were to give you an opportunity to share those testimonies, which you should at some point, that we give God a lot of glory because how many of you, God didn't say, okay, we're going to put you on a 14-year plan on how to change your life. How many of you had the moment where you believed that God's way was right and immediately God met you there and your life started a different course? Say amen to that if that was you. Sometimes we still get off course on the course. But there was a start. In there, the belief system changed. 
I've said many times my belief system about God's love changed through that woman sitting right up there. And when that woman loved me at my worst when she didn't have to and shouldn't have. I experienced God's love in a way I'd never experienced it before. And I knew right then and there, that woman deeply loves me. And not with a human love, but with a godly love. And it gave me a great confidence to survive a very difficult season. How many of you have ever had somebody love you in a way that was life-changing? Slip your hand up because some of you are already standing. It was life-changing. You can build on that love. You can take on anything. Everybody stand with me. We'll close. Stand up. I wish we could take you into small groups right now to have a conversation, but we can't. But if I were to ask you why you believe in God in the first place, you should be able to answer it. If I were to ask you why you believe Jesus is salvation, you should be able to answer it. If I were to ask you today, what is the right and wrong way to raise your family? You should be able to answer that based on what you've studied and established in your life. Stop letting your life be dictated by other people who just want to manage your behaviors. We're about to go into an election season, right? And what are all election campaign ads intended to do? Huh? <laughs> Bash the other ones, what she said, right? But what's that intended to do? To change the way you believe. You know why they want to change the way that you believe? Anybody? Because Washington wants to make you better? Huh? And why do they want you to believe like they do? For your vote. For your vote. They want your behavior. And I am not going to stand here and say which side you do. But I should say this. You should have enough moral beliefs in your life that your vote is not dictated on what somebody tells you. So it's like this. If I'm going to raise my house to serve the Lord, my belief system should come through God's word and the influence of it, not somebody else's opinion. Jesus showed up, changed her beliefs, and from her belief system change, an entire city changed. We cannot heal Jefferson County through drugs. Saying, we're going to go out here and help people get off drugs, although that is something we do. We should heal the county by introducing them to Jesus so that they can establish a belief system that they can stand on. That will give them the strength and courage to change the way they behave. So what do you know about God? And can I tell you my answer? Not near enough. Any me too's on that one? And don't just settle for this being the sermon you listened to this week and now you're good till next Sunday. Go find out. Go dig. Go taste the Lord and see that he's good. When you're disciplining your kids this week, you're trying to instruct them on what's right, don't just talk about their behavior. Teach them why they need to change that behavior. We don't play in the road because we could get hit by a car, right? Not, don't play in the road. All that seems like is you're somebody that doesn't want to have fun. Am I right? But teach them. There's danger there. Don't play in a blackberry bush. Why? Come on now. Snakes. Thorns. Who cares about the thorns? There may be snakes. You know what I learned? I was, I was, I was out of somebody's house just two days ago, and they're like, hey, you see this blackberry bush? They took me over to it. We were standing there. And they said, check this out. This is where the mama bear brings her cubs, and they sit here and they eat. And I'm like, then why are we here? Like, I wish you'd have told me from over there. I, I would have believed you from over there. Why are we standing here? Look at this video. Hey, I really love your home. I got to go. Right? Like, 
it, it, it's an understanding when we teach our kids, listen to schools and everything else is going to teach your kids, not just education, but their belief systems. When we teach them that this is God's way of having a family, this is God's way of doing something, we should tell them why. I love that, God, that Jesus didn't just come and say, you better believe in God. He told us why. If you'll do this, this is what God will do. If you'll do this, this is who he is. There's 7,000 promises in the word of God. And almost every single one of them comes with a premise that says this. If you want this result, that's the promise. The premise is this action. And if you'll believe this and you'll do this, then this will be the result. And I'm going to take a poll. This is how we're going to close today. How many of you have found it to be true that living outside of God's plan for your life led to some of the hardest things you've ever experienced? Would you slip your hands up in the air? Yeah, that's almost everybody I can see. All right. So we know the Bible's right on that. How many of you found this to be true? By obeying God, you saw things work out in a supernatural way that blew your mind. It defied logic, and God did things that were well above or well beyond. You say, well, I've never seen that. Maybe you called it coincidence or luck. But you saw something work out in your life because that belief in God was powerful and worked. Would you slip your hand up? Yeah. So as we see that today, I go back to that question. What do you believe? Why? Go build a good belief system. Because like Jesus said to her, if you only knew what God wanted to give you, instead of asking the world for a drink this week, instead of asking your addiction or your fix, or instead of asking your hobby for some kind of a satisfaction that's only going to be temporary, you'd be going straight to the Father saying, hey, give me a drink because I know what you're going to give me. Is going to satisfy my life, my heart, my body, my soul. He's in control. Amen.